You know what it's like when you're thirsty, isn't it? You, you, you're, you're desperate for something to drink. I have that experience if I, if I go somewhere on holiday or like I was on retreat this week, the place I was staying had uh, all the breakfast. You know, it had all the breakfast. And uh, every morning I would have my, you know, my cereal, a wee glass of orange juice, some water, preparing myself for the salty onslaught that was going to come in the form of the bacon and the sausage and the square sausage and the, you know, all that sort of stuff. And, and you know as you're sitting there eating it, I am going to suffer for this the rest of the day, uh, not only with the indigestion, but for the insatiable desire to be drinking water all the day. And you know what happens when you drink water all the day. It's, it's that cycle you just get into. You'd know, just sitting down to that breakfast, that you're setting up for thirst. You're going to be parched and dry all the day. I'm going to need water all the day until all the salt's out of the system again. And then you get up next morning and you do the, the same thing and you, you, you're back to the water again and again. So and I'm thinking, God, why do I do this to myself? And I think to myself, actually, it's not, just a, it's not just a metaphor of my breakfast experience. It's a metaphor of my life. It's a metaphor of my life in terms of spiritual alertness and spiritual dryness. I discovered about myself this week that I have got the habit of believing that because God filled me with his spirit on the 17th of October 1995, that that's going to be enough for the 20th of October 2023. And so I get myself into this place where I wonder, Lord, why am I so dry? Why do I seem so far away from you? And then I reflect on the experience of the breakfast where, I, where I'm reminded that I constantly need to come and drink again from the waters of God. You know, God gets us into that place where we are so dependent on his presence in the same way that we are dependent on water. We need water to drink. And in fact, I need some now. We were, we're dependent on this stuff. We need it, and, and we're made of it. You know, I don't know what's the percentage of our bodies that are made up of water. It's, it's something ridiculous. It, it's, it's the very source of life physically, and it's, it's the sustainer of life. And the very same when it comes to our need for the presence of God. And the simple fact of it is, in spite of the fact that I know that I need to come to God on a regular basis to eat of him, to drink of him, to be refreshed in him, do I? I, I sometimes think I can go days, you know. I think I'm like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm. And then, then I, I think, oh, it's a bit dry around here. Lord, my, my heart's getting a little bit hard and it's, it, my prayers get a little bit dry. And, and the, the words on the page are starting to get, I have to read that sentence three times before I even know what the words are, let alone understand it. And then I wonder what is going on. We rely on our own resources. This passage is a powerful little passage that we refer to uh, today. Here we have this very practical situation. Um, King Ahab has died. They're now at a situation where an agreement between Moab and Ahab um, that was in existence is no longer in existence because he's taken advantage of the fact that the other king has died and he's thinking, as it, no more sheep fleeces for them. It's like, it's like a knitter's nightmare. No more fleeces. <laughs> no more fleeces. No more wool. And that's where they're at. And, and this, this, this angers um, the, the, the potential recipient of these things. And he, he's up in arms and he's going to go after them. And not only is he going to go after them, he's got this strategy. He's going to ask the kings around about him to go after him as well. He's going to sort this situation right and good. And, and so we get this situation where these three kings of these three kingdoms with their three armies and all their men and all their horses, they set out with this great scheme, this great strategy. And they get from where they've gathered and they march for seven days uh, towards this place where they're going to show uh, the Moabites, you know, what, what for. Uh, and then they discover one drastic thing. Imagine this. This is, a, this is a, a thought out strategy. These three kings have got together and they've thought to myself, we can do this. We can do this. 
with all our might, with all our resources, with all our force, we can go and advance on this enemy and get from our enemy the things that we think are rightfully ours. They've got every human resource. They've got every strength. They've got strategy. They know where they're going to go. They know where they're going to attack. And as they begin to go about their strategy, they discover the one thing that they really lack. And it's the one thing they cannot provide for themselves. They have unity. They have strength in numbers. They have strategy. They have a will. But they lack the one thing that they cannot manufacture themselves. No wonder when they realize that they've got no water, one of them goes, what? What? In that moment of realization that in spite of all the human resources that they've gathered, they do not have the one thing necessary that will give them victory on the battlefield. You cannot take men and horses into a battle with no water. You just cannot do it. I come back to myself. All the resources, all the resources that we Andrew Clark has managed to gather to himself over the years. All the things that I think are good about me, all the human strategies, all the great ideas, all the this and the that and the next thing. And so many times I come to the place where I recognize it means nothing if I don't have water. It means nothing if I don't have the living water that flows from the throne. Our churches, our organizations, our ministries, we can have all the best things in the world. We can have the best wee halls. We can have the best heating, the most delicious biscuits with a cup of tea. Some of them have amazing parking things. I was in churches this week that were just glorious, you know, a thousand year old, but just absolutely wonderful, glorious. We have all this stuff. And today we've got our technology. You've got YouTube. We've got this and that and the next thing. We have all this stuff. We have all the resources that any people of God could ever need. But we're often lacking the water. We're often lacking the power, the fire, whatever you want to call it. And that is the one thing that we cannot provide. I can provide you with a sermon, but I can't provide you with living water. I can provide you a teaching, but I can't give you the fire. I can give you a wee bit of motivation, but I can't give you the divine energy that you'll need to be able to take it into Monday morning. I'm, I'm convinced that 99%, 99.9% of sermons outlive their usefulness two minutes after the service. <laughs> because it's not about what we can drum up for ourselves in human terms. <coughs> It's about getting into the God who is the one who provides the supernatural power. Now, am I the only one, folks, who rely on my own natural abilities and skill and forget that I need to come before the God who has a living water? I don't think I am. <coughs> Have you got a Bible at home? Have you got one? Anyone got more than one? You must have got this. Come and look at these two. I mean, I must have about 20 at least. <coughs> but it's going to have no power at all if it sits on the shelf. It's going to have no power at all unless it's read and ingested and allowed to do its work. If any of you got a mind and a, and a tongue that will pray a word to God, it's not going to do anything unless your mouth opens. And God graciously responds to our cries with his power and with his presence. I haven't really asked you the pertinent question yet that I often ask congregations. Are you in the word, folks? Are you in prayer? Now, there's no condemnation for those that are in Jesus Christ, but sometimes we need a good boot, you know? We need a good boot. So here's your pastoral boot. Get about it. What else have you got to do with this one life but to live for God and to enjoy Him and then to live for Him? All your human resources won't hack it. 
We come to him for the living water. We trust in resources that we devise for ourselves. This church will go nowhere. This church will go absolutely nowhere if we're only trusting resources that we can provide for ourselves. And if you're trusting Andrew Clark, well, let me tell you this. I mean, just don't. Honestly, just don't. We need to come to him. So they trusted resources that they devised themselves, these kings, and they found themselves short. And so when they got to that point of desperation, um, it's encouraging, I think, uh, when we come into verse 11, uh, one of the kings says, well, is there, is there a prophet of the Lord around here? Because when you're in the, 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 the sticky place, when you've got to the stage where you realise that you, you can do the thing with your own resources, uh, the, it, isn't it true that, oh, then we think of it, God, you know? Yeah, well, they should have been do- at this stage before they even got together. When they were sitting having their, their little conference about what they were going to do to the king of Moab and the Moabites, they should have been coming to the Lord then. But, here, but isn't it human life that we come to the sticky point? Uh, and now they choose uh, to inquire of the Lord. You see, having been trusting resources that they can only devise themselves, they now seek the word that only God can give. They, they learned the lesson late, but at least they learned it. They, they, they seek him in retrospect. Anyone ever been there? You ever been there? You've got yourself into a whole thing. Oh, maybe, it's now, maybe now it's time to seek the Lord. Uh, maybe now it's time to seek the Lord. Well, that is grace. And Elisha, who's who, I say, just literally taken over uh, from the, the prophet Elijah, um, it, it describes him as the, as the man who washed Elijah's hands. Did you notice that? He, he was Elijah's servant. He, he had been schooled under the ministry of Elijah, and, and he had been blessed and anointed, uh, having asked for a double portion of Elijah's blessing in order that he could carry on his ministry. And when they come to Elisha, he doesn't... I think there's inspiration for preachers and pastors. He doesn't welcome them with open arms. He more or less says, what are you doing here, you bunch of scoundrels? You know, he, 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 sort of, he, he, he puts this distance between them and him because he's probably recognising what's happened. Here are people who have gone after their own desires without seeking God, and now they come to me. And, and so there's not this ready sort of gushing willingness on Elisha's part to provide answers here. And, and what he's doing, I think, is he's, he's revealing to them the head and the heart of those that have come. <coughs> you, you've come. You've come late, guys. Uh, and who are you to come and seek of the Lord now? But come they do, nevertheless. And then we get this, I don't know if you picked up this little uh, verse. Um, while, it, while, it's, while they were seeking after um, Elisha for a word of the Lord... Um, Elisha says, well, because Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, is here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to listen to you. Now bring me a harp. <laughs> you notice that? Now bring me a harp. That's what you see in every crisis, don't you? Uh, what am I going to do now? Oh, bring me a harp, please. <laughs> We've got one in our house. We've got a, a budding harpist and a clarsackist in our house. Um, but still, still at this stage, it's not my first response. Bring me a harp. That will, that will give me... But, but before Elisha gets to the stage where he, he, he gives this utterance, which can only come from the Lord. He asks for the harpist. What's going on there? Elisha gets into the place where he's worshipping, where he's being ministered to. He's in the presence of God. Whatever situation he, he's in here, I don't, we don't know what environment Elisha is sitting in whilst this is all happening. But his immediate response is, bring me the harp. Bring me the harp. And it's, it's that entering into that space of worship and adoration. That sense of being aware of the God that they worship. His majesty and his glory. He gets himself into that place of worshipful intercession. It's only one short sentence in the passage. And it gives no sense of time at all between the bringing of the harp and the giving of the word. But I would like to suggest to you that it wasn't just bring the harp, here's the word. There, there was a, there, however long it was, there was an abiding. There was an abiding in the worship of God. And out of that place of intimacy and worship, the word came. The word came. The word 
that they needed for God, from God for the situation came in that moment. I've asked you about picking up your Bible. I've asked you about a word of prayer. What about your song? What about your adoration? What about the opening of yourself to the presence of Almighty God through the course of your day, whatever your circumstance, knowing that as you come in worship, you come into the very throne room, the very courts of God, you're singing with the angels, you're accessing majesty and glory. You're getting away from the context you're in into the context of heavenly worship. And you're seeing things from a new perspective and you're hearing from God the things you need to hear for the moment. Can you sing? doesn't even matter if you can. I mean, some of you really can. I mean, honestly. <laughs> but it's not the case of can you. But it's will you. Will you. Oh my. Do you remember what the, 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 the Jews sang or said when they were sitting by the rivers of Babylon? You know, they, they were saying, oh, give us one of your songs, give us one of your songs, and they were reluctant. But actually, in that situation, their songs were all that they had. Their songs of Zion, their songs of promise, their songs of hope were all that they had that would bring them back into the presence of the God who speaks by his word and who would rescue his people. Where's your song? And are you singing it? Are you making space to come into that place where you are removed from the everyday earthness of the world and come into the presence of the living God? And boy... Some of us need to go there more than others. Some of us swim around in our own circumstances and are overcome by them on a daily basis. And I'm not talking about you, I'm talking about me. But I know it applies to some of you as well. And sometimes the last thing we want to do is is to do that. But you notice how immediately Elisha makes that response, bring me the harp, bring me the harp. Let, let, Let my song be blended with the song of heaven so that you might hear from the Lord. You, got, you with me so far? Mm. You with me so far? Is it making any sense to you? Yeah. Does it highlight a need? Yeah. Are you going to do anything about it? Yeah. <sighs> I hope so. <laughs> because after that, we then, we then get not the three kings strategy, not even Elisha's strategy, but a God strategy. And how do we know it's a God strategy? How do you know that anything is a God strategy? I think you know it's a God strategy when it seems absolutely stupid and absolutely impossible with human resources. Because the word that comes from Elisha, the prophet, is, um, you know, this situation isn't hard for God, Elisha says. This situation looks terrible for you. You're beside yourselves. You're desperate. You're, you're, you're crying out to me, the wee prophet of the Lord, but to God, this is nothing. God can do this. And he says to them, you're not going to see any wind. Isn't that, wouldn't that be great? You're not going to see any rain. What a, what a glorious promise. You're not going to see any of that. In other words, you're not going to see any physical manifestation of what God is about to do for you. But you <coughs> will see this dry valley filled with pools and streams of water. You're not going to have any idea, in other words, where it's going to come from. It's not even going to be the earth that will provide this. It's not going to be a natural phenomenon that will come into play and provide this thing that you need in order that you can go and fight your battle. It is God alone who is going to do this. And so here are these three kings who sit upon their human task to accomplish their human achievements without consulting God and having come to God are brought up close with the fact that we, they just haven't thought about it. They just haven't saw. And God answers by saying, I am going to provide you with the only thing that I can provide. Not the thing that you can provide, not the thing that you can manufacture, not the thing that you can work up, not the thing that you can create. The thing which will come only from the hand of God. Do you believe that God is sovereign? Do you believe that God is sovereign? That means that God is sovereign. 
It means that every decision, every happening, every thing that occurs in your life and on the face of the planet is known by the God who knows everything or is caused by the God who causes everything or is withheld by the God who withholds what he will withhold. He is in control of everything. And he comes in this moment to this people for this next little squabble on their journey and he provides for them what only God can provide. And what he, what he provides is he provides the blessing of water on dry ground. The blessing of water on dry ground. Friends, that is good news for you and for me. God will provide the blessing of water on dry ground. God will provide the blessing of water on my my parched dry ground and it will bubble up it's always been a promise of God listen to Isaiah 44 verse 3 for I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants this is a stated intention of God to his people. Yes, to the people of the Old Testament, but ever living today. It was Peter who said, this promise, this promise of the Spirit is for you, for your children and for your children's children and every generation of those who will seek after God. He will pour out the water on dry ground. I have to say, I'm full of, I'm full of lovely little stories from, from the move of God on the Isle of Lewis. And, and one, of the, one of the ways in which God moved was there was a prayer meeting that had been called together in Lewis. Uh, and just one of the many prayer meetings is these folks living in a desperate island where, where there was no young people in the churches. Everything had gone to the wall. That They were desperate. Even the presbytery had put out a letter to all the churches and in the local newspaper saying, look, we're sinful guys. We're worried about, you know, the lack of, you know, engagement with God here on our island. Can you imagine that today? Can you imagine the Aaron Banner? Can you imagine that letter in there? Can you imagine it? But that's what they did. And they, they were absolutely desperate. And there was one of the times where they, they, they gave themselves to prayer and there was one young man who in that prayer meeting stood up and read out that verse from Isaiah 44 for I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and blessing on your descendants and so he said something like God your honour is at stake you need to do this for us you need to do this for us your honour is at stake and so those men, they pleaded the promise of God that he would pour water on the dry ground, and God duly did. And there are many stories, amazing stories, where even without human resource, God moved in power. I was reading a story by uh, Duncan Campbell, who was one of the folks who was involved in the thing that happened on Lewis. And he was saying that he, he was preaching in one village, and, and God seemed to do something in the church that he was in. The, the presence of God came upon the people. There was a, a cry out for repentance and the presence of God came. But then they heard that at the same time as God was doing something in the church that he was in, the village just down the road, God of himself had done something amongst those people and they were in the streets crying out to God for mercy. Because it was God who was doing it. It wasn't Duncan Campbell. It wasn't the church. It wasn't. It was God, the sovereign God, who responded to the cries of his people for living water. What would it look like if on a Sunday morning God would visit us with his living water and the people of Corrie would get swept up in all that God was doing when there was nobody there. What about if in the next few weeks and Lamb Lash no longer has their church, but there's a praying people somewhere calling down the living water in the presence of God and it skips by them and goes straight to Lamb Lash and they're out in the street. I can't imagine it. You know people from Lamb Lash, don't you? You can't imagine it. Because this is not, these things are not human doings. They are God doings. And where is our faith? Where is our faith 
that God will actually show himself by his power. Where is our faith that God can do that? And where is our faith that will move us in this generation on our watch, friends, to apply ourselves to prayer? You see, they discovered in this passage that God had done what God would said he would do when it came to the time of sacrifice. Isn't that interesting? At the time when they would be usually performing sacrifices that would be atoning for their sins or calling upon God, it's at that time God responded. That There's a synergy between what we offer to God of ourselves and what we, we do in our worship and what we do as we call upon him and how God answers. What time is it? I don't mean what time is it. I mean, it's just before 12. But what time is it really? Is it a time where we are just going to minister on in our own resources, in our own way, with our own skills, with our own abilities, with our own clever strategies, with our own ideas for this or that or the next thing? Well, if we put that on, then this will happen. Or if we do something for the kids, that will mean the parents will get saved as well. And then before we know it, da 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 You know, let, let me tell you from over 20 years of experience in ministry, that's not going to work. All, all you're going to do is you're going to end up flat on your face because you're parched, dry and thirsty. Because in the middle of all that activity, you have no time to draw aside and seek the God who can answer by water and by fire and by everything else. Will we come and be a praying people? who will turn to God at the first instance and recognising that there are things that only, only he, only he can provide.